How is everyone? Good. Good. Nice. Nice to see like everyone is not fully asleep. <laughs> I'm Raghu Vate. I'm the field CTO and VP strategy for Zadida. Uh, and I'm going to touch upon running Kubernetes on ocean vessels and precisely commercial maritime uh, vessels today. Okay. Before we get started, um, a quick, very quick overview on Zadida. I promise I won't spend like uh, half the talk talking about Zadida. We are uh, a eight-year-old venture-backed company, a Silicon Valley-based company, uh, spread across uh, the world, uh, Berlin, uh, US, uh, and uh, India. Uh, and uh, we started with a mission, um, almost 80 years ago, we started with a mission of uh, enabling edge computing. And again, the edge computing, what we thought 80 years ago, and the edge computing that we are talking about today is different. Not very different, but definitely different. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, identified right from the beginning is that you need to have a reliable, economical, and viable orchestration at the edge. And that is what is going to differentiate the deployments at the edge versus deployments in the data centers and in the cloud. Okay, so we have made a lot of progress in terms of the app stack, and the app stack needs to change a little bit when it gets to the edge, but not a lot. But the way you manage the assets at the edge changes completely, and because of the variety and the diversity that is introduced at the edge. It's not just the diversity based on the type of hardware you are going to use. It's not diversity, it's not only the diversity that is based out of the applications or the application form factors, but it is also the people, the kind of people who are managing it, the kind of people that are available to manage your assets at the edge, and also the policy that you have to put to handle the scale of the edge. And when we talk about the scale of the edge, we are not talking about tens or hundreds or thousands. We are talking of hundreds of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands going into millions. And how do you manage that? That is what we had in mind when we started Zadida. And because of that, we were able to like have a very good traction in a lot of verticals. We started out with oil and gas and oil and gas services, but then expanded into other verticals like manufacturing, automotive, retail, agribusiness, and transportation, including both shipping and railways. Right? The one thing that we uh, identified right at the beginning is edge is an ecosystem play. You cannot do it alone. You have to bring multiple partners together and multiple parties together. And by creating that horizontal platform, that makes it easy to bring those partners and par uh, others like OEMs or SIs together is the thing that is going to enable edge. And uh, enabling outcomes at the edge is going to enable the uh, sophisticated solutions that people want to bring. And all the things that people touch and feel are things that are happening at the edge. Okay, now the one thing that like when I started thinking about uh, this uh, talk about uh, how do I talk about like the maritime uh, uh, commercial maritime and how Kubernetes is playing a role in there, um, didn't feel right that like I start with commercial maritime. You need to understand where that whole landscape is. So I picked one supply chain to talk about. Again, this is this is my life and like. Uh, uh, I definitely grew a lot more gray hair after joining Zadida and dealing with uh, all these problems. Um, but the supply chain is, are, is, a, is an essential part of uh, how you need to look at edge. It's not just one piece. What happens next? What happens next? What happens next? Right? So I took one example. It is a partial list. I'm not talking, going to talk about every single entity in that supply chain logistics. But let's start with uh, agribusiness. We today have a customer uh, who has uh, 20,000 farms. And their needs are pretty simple. They want to manage farm logistics and management. They want to be able to like, manage the milking and uh, uh, feeding robots in the farms. They want to be able to provide remote support. And they came to us and they said, hey, and this was a year, year and a half ago. They came to us and they said, we have this legacy application, Windows-based and Linux-based. We want to run it on the farm. I need edge orchestration. Can you manage it? And we do. Okay, so we manage uh, virtual machines, containers, native containers, and runtimes like Kubernetes and others too, right? So he said yes. But soon their container stack grew. 
because they are adding more and more services. And that is where they figured out that a simple native uh, container management is not enough. They need a container orchestration system. And the obvious choice for them was Kubernetes, not only because of the community support that is there, but also because of uh, its maturity. And they want to future-proof their own solution. Now, all of a sudden, there is a farm IT that is trying to manage 20,000 Kubernetes clusters spread across the world. Okay. Now, think just, just close your eyes and think about it. That is almost impossible. These guys are not equipped, and they do not have enough tooling to actually do this. Right? So that is where we are trying to like, enable them and like, get them the right tooling and take them on the right journey. The same thing is true when it comes to the next step of that. OK, you have the uh, dairy. You, have, you've, you've, you procure the product, m milk in this case, right, or meat. What do you do next? You go to your processing plants and uh, the bottling plants. Now, the kind of things that are very, very important for them are things like quality assurance, uh, predictive maintenance, uh, things like uh, optimizing their processes based off uh, AI at the edge and other things. And now, not only do they have to do all of this, but they have to run this inside the Purdue model. And anyone who has uh, broken their head on the Purdue model and like, uh, who has dealt with it knows how hard it is. Running Kubernetes inside the Purdue model is not a small feat. right? And being able to manage it at scale. It's, you cannot have a Kubernetes expert in every plant that you have. That's not just possible. So now, that is where they are running Kubernetes inside the Purdue model. Next, go, let's skip ahead to transportation, whether it is railways or commercial maritime, where you have the product. You take the product and take it to a retail. That's the goal, end goal, right? But during this process, you have to manage food safety. This, these are perishable goods, and like they are all refrigerated. How do you manage the refrigerators? What happens if the ter temperature inside the refrigerator goes beyond the threshold? How do you sense that, and how do you take preventive actions? Those are the kind of things that railways have started thinking about nowadays. They're also very concerned about rail safety itself. OK, that's a different topic, but they have these bunglers that are besides the trains, and they have all different kinds of sensors that actually are sensing what is happening on the rails when a train passes by. And based on that, they can now tell if there is a need to like, uh, take any uh, preemptive uh, maintenance on the, on the tracks or even on the rail. right? And what they do is like, when they start with one or two applications, and soon that bloats up into like 10 different microservices that are running in a bungalow. And that needs Kubernetes. Now, just one of our customers is running 12,000 of these things out in the field. And it is not easy. It is not easy because of the connectivity needs, because you cannot expect everyone to have like a full-fledged connectivity when you are sitting on the side of a track throughout the tracks. Right? Then let's uh, go to the commercial maritime. And I'm going to double click on this in this talk. But they have a similar need, food safety and monitoring. They have uh, connectivity issues. But their connectivity issues are even exaggerated. If you are crisscrossing the ocean, then it is very, very hard for you to have a guaranteed connectivity, but also a reliable connectivity. So that is something that, and on top of that, they also have to deal with applications that deal with crew safety and crew health. And health, it can be health, or providing them that mental health in terms of like providing them a way to talk to their families when they are in the middle of the ocean. Those are all the kind of things the commercial uh, maritime is looking at. And finally, you get to retail, and you have the use cases, the well-known use cases, like connectivity and security in the retail. You have theft detection uh, and shrinkage that is becoming very, very popular with the advent of the AI tool set that can actually make it happen, right? And the obvious uh, advertising and signage that is inside the retail. So these are the kind of things that we are dealing with. And this is what running Kubernetes at the edge means, running 20,000 uh, Kubernetes clusters in the farms. Not a very huge Kubernetes cluster, but very small, but 20,000 of them. Or running 12,000 Kubernetes clusters besides the train tracks. Or running hundred thousands of Kubernetes clusters floating in the ocean, right? This is what I deal with uh, at Zadida day in and day out. And I wanted to touch upon how, double click on the commercial maritime today, 
A and go in uh, to one case study. Okay, uh, this is one of our global commercial uh, maritime customers. They own around 6, 000, sorry, 600 vessels. On an average, every vessel is uh, 20 to 45 days uh, on sea, uh, and uh, they dock in as many as 340 different ports in 120 countries, right? Um, and they transport around 15 million TEUs, okay? A TEU, if you guys don't know, I even I had to look up when I first uh, saw that term, is a 20-foot equivalent unit. So these are the 20-foot containers, okay? They are stacked up on top of each other. And they transport around a million refrigerated containers. A million of them, think of it, like every single container has a sensor sending sensor data back to a certain place that actually is making sense of that. And this is big business for them. This is $21 billion just for that one shipping company, and they want to invest in how to reduce the spoilage of the uh, goods inside during transit, okay? They came to us um, a year, actually more than a year ago, uh, with these problems. I mean, there are a whole bunch of slew of problems, but uh, just uh, picked the top five uh, to talk about in this uh, forum. Uh, the first one is integrity. They really wanted to know what is happening inside their containers. These are containers that are stacked almost 20, 30, 30 containers uh, deep, right? So now what is going to happen is like if there is a refrigerator container inside, it's just not possible to have physical access to that when, it is, when something is wrong, okay? So what they want to know is like have a sensor and be able to like uh, get the data from that sensor in on board and be able to take actions. And this is not new. They have been doing this for almost 10 years right now, but they have been doing it using 2G because they can't uh, draw wires from every container. They have been doing it with 2G, and 2G has a really big problem. It has a lot of blind spots. So now what happens is like, till you actually get to the port and open the uh, refrigerator or look at it, inspect it, you really won't be able to tell whether there's something wrong or not. And they wanted to fix that. And they wanted to fix it and also increase the reliability at which they gather that information. They are very concerned about security. They are, it's not just about security in terms of applications and infrastructure security. They are concerned about what happens if somebody accidentally opens the thing once. Now, it's almost like, it's not equivalent, but it's almost like, okay, you loss on warranty if you are opening the container and moving, closing it back, right? So they wanted to put in place a, a, a solution that can tell them that like, hey, this container was opened four times and who opened it? What was the badge that was used to open? So all of these kind of things. Connectivity is a huge problem for them. They wanted to have connectivity inside the vessel, uh, whether it is, um, Wi-Fi, whether it is 2G, 3G, 4G, but they're also concerned about connectivity to the van, uh, to oh, remote operations. So they predominantly were using Geo and Mio, so very expensive, very low bandwidth, but highly reliable. That is what they were using. Now Starlink came in and disrupted that market. If there is, if you guys are following that, Starlink is really, really disrupting that market. What they are doing is. The thing that you are going to pay like tens of thousands of dollars, I'm going to give it to you for a few hundred dollars per month, right? The bandwidth is higher. But the thing is like it's not very reliable. But these vessels have to maintain that reliable connectivity because of uh, the kind of need they have, but it is also dictated by all the uh, commercial agreements that they have with every other uh, country and everything else. So now they want to have all of those uh, connectivity in one place. Break fix is a huge problem for them. Uh, if there is a problem on the vessel, they have to go dock, and then they need to have a person who is skilled to actually fix that be in that place, which is almost impossible for them. So any problem that happens on the vessel takes 30 to 45 days to actually get fixed, and that means that like loss of productivity or like lots of goods for them. And there is no over there updates. And because they are dealing with all the 2G e, uh, endpoints, the SIM management becomes a nightmare for them, okay? And then operations. The operations, I talked about operations, but lack of uh, remote monitoring, lack of uh, visibility, and just a simple thing as uh, remote access, secure remote access was not possible for them. So these are the problems that they came to, they, they had. And uh, they wanted to change their uh, 
uh, architecture and build a solution that solves all these problems, right? And they have a roadmap for themselves too. It is not that they want to solve it in one day. So I am going, not going to touch upon everything uh, that we help them with, but like I, I want to concentrate on two portions. The first one is uh, actually how do you enable connectivity and applications on board? The first thing they had to do was like they wanted to go to new age wireless technology. They wanted to go to 5G, but 5G endpoints on the other side were still not available for them. So they settled on 4G. And if you want to have a private 4G, then you need to run a private uh, 4G packet core on, on board. So these guys are actually running a 5G, or sorry, 4G packet core on every vessel. Uh, we partnered uh, with uh, 4G packet core providers and then made that happen. What that also meant was that this 4G packet core, all the 4G packet core are like Kubernetes clusters. They run on a Kubernetes uh, infrastructure. So now they started thinking about, okay, I need to run Kubernetes on this vessel. And if I'm able to run that, I can actually bring in crew safety into that picture. I can bring in other data and sensor analytics tools into that picture. And then minimize the amount of data that I send back to the supporting infrastructure, or they have a very small data center on board too, right? So that is what they did, and we enabled the Kubernetes. But now they had to deal with all different other problems as, hey, what happens if my connectivity is not always uh, available? What happens if it is not available and I want to make some changes? So those are the kind of things that we had to solve to make that side of the picture whole. Now, that is not the whole story. The second side of it is they wanted to have a solution where they can get the Geo, Mio, and Leo, or Leo being Starlink in this case, all combined together and have a aggregated connectivity service where it is both economical, reliable, and viable too. Okay, so we partnered with another uh, provider of that, and they have a very similar thing too. So we built that solution for them where they are able to like uh, aggregate those three different types of transports. And all the applications that they use to aggregate them are running on top of a Kubernetes cluster that is housed on a separate uh, uh, physical device. Uh, and then on top of that, they are also running a perimeter firewall and uh, SD-WAN appliance on it. So this is connectivity as a service that they are providing to commercial maritime or remote locations, but commercial maritime being one of the verticals that they handle. So we brought all of these things together, and because we were able to do this, their operations cost drastically reduced. They are able to now manage all of their fleet. They are not fully deployed yet, but most of it is deployed, and when they get to all of it, they are able to like manage all of their fleet from a central location. They are able to see if things are going to go wrong, predictive maintenance, and now, they are able to actually derive value out of the data that they already own. Previously, think of this data as being just thrown on the floor because there is nothing else they could do with it. Now they are doing predictive maintenance uh, with it. They are actually able to like figure out what is going to go wrong and make sure that the correct person who can actually fix it uh, is available on the port when the ship docks. The, these ships, they dock for a few hours and they have to go. They are not going to sit there for a few more hours just because a technician is late or anything else, right? So they have to like do a lot of logistics prior to the ship docks, and now they are able to do that. Previously, they used to just pull in like four or five different people because they don't know what is wrong. Now they know what is wrong, right? And they are also able to enable a lot of other third-party services. And these guys are taking their solution and going to cruise ships and saying that if we can do this with maritime, this whole solution can be done in a cruise ships too. So, and Zedida, uh, again, I know this is, uh, a, this is not a product pitch, uh, but Zedida is able to like, enable all of that by actually enabling the remote orchestration and management of this whole fleet from a centralized location, uh, which is delivered as a SaaS. And we have solutions which actually enables them to do on-prem uh, management of all, of all these assets. And in all of this, security is paramount. And we are able to provide all that security uh, that is needed uh, to not only like run these assets, but it is also about policy and people. Because you need to be able to like manage the people who are managing your assets. 
And when you have a very large number of uh, clusters, you cannot actually deal with them one at a time. You have to segregate them into sub, sub fleets, and then they say, this fleet has to follow this policy. And we enabled all of that. Okay? Now, I'm not going to go through uh, each and every one of these uh, uh, bullet points here. You all can read. These uh, slides will be available. I want to leave some time for questions if you have any. Uh, but uh, doing all of these things made our customers' experience uh, a lot better. And they started believe in the, believing in the fact that, like, OK, now I can take all the sophisticated uh, technology that I have created in, my, in the data centers and in the cloud and bring it back to the edge. So this is enabling the kind of services that uh, they are providing to their customers. Okay. I know 20 minutes is a very short time to go over all of this. If you guys want to like, learn more, we will be at booth A8 uh, tomorrow onwards, or we are just across the uh, hallway here. Uh, come talk to us. Um, and we have uh, a social uh, that is one of those uh, QR codes would be the social. Uh, okay. That's what I have for today, but like, I'm more than happy to answer any of your questions. A uh, very good question. So uh, we have to deal with air-gapped environments. Not only do we have to deal with air-gapped environments, we also have to deal with unpredictable environments, where like you might have connectivity today, but like you will not have tomorrow. Or even if you have the connectivity, it has very, very low bandwidth, uh, and like you cannot actually do anything meaningful on top of it. So we have a solution called Edge Sync, which which makes sure that you will be able to manage all the assets on that location, whether it is a vessel, whether it's a train, or like a retail store or a farm. We have, you can manage all the assets. The source of truth still being uh, the cloud. And we also provide a path, a seamless path, where you do not have to lift and shift your infrastructure just because you are going from on-prem to uh, the cloud. So it is, as soon as you have the cloud connectivity, everything will resync. And actually, I take it back. There is nothing really to resync except for the metrics. Uh, and, and state, and everything will be back to normal. So if you are more interested, it is definitely a little bit more involved than what I just did. But uh, if you are more interested, please reach out to us, and we'll be more than happy to like uh, explain more. Yes, sir. So is your solution just a cloud solution? Can you please repeat it? Um, uh, yes and no. So we first started out as a SaaS-based uh, offering. Um, and most of our customers uh, still use that. That's still the predominant one that we have. Uh, but we do have uh, a lot of our customers who want everything, the SaaS, the cluster being in their control. OK? So we have solutions, not solutions. We have deployments where like, we have deployed in people's uh, or in customers' uh, private VPCs or in their data centers. That is done. But then we also have others who are like, OK, we want it real on-prem because of either security reasons, because they are running in places that they do not trust uh, and uh, non-reliable. So we do have a solution, a full-fledged on-prem solution. And obviously, there are commercials based on those things. Yes, 100%. Again, if it is, if it is uh, in your private VPC or things like that, so we have a lot of experience doing that. But uh, if, you want it on a, if you want it on a couple of servers that are sitting under your desk, OK, so that is where like, uh, we are going to be uh, announcing something soon. Okay. Uh, please keep an eye out for it. But if it is a private VPC, we have a lot of deployments for that. OK, and if we decide to go that route, would your team support the installation, or would you just give us you know, a bundle of documentation and call it a day? Um, so for, for our SaaS, uh, it is obviously like we, we manage every single thing. Correct. Uh, for the private VPCs, uh, we still manage it as a managed service. It depends on how, what are the kind of restrictions you have. It can Correct. be a badge access. It can be a RE sitting inside. Or we can also go through a few certifications so that you would know what it is. But most of our current deployed customers, they just give us badge access and like uh, we do the management on top for them but that is just the cluster 
Everything right. in the cluster is owned by you and your administrators right. and okay. everything else. All right. Thank you so much, friend. Those are all and the no questions. Worries. Any? Up. Uh, I'm just curious. Oh, I'm just curious. Testing? Oh, cool. Uh, so, maritime vessels have, especially when you're scaling out horizontally, have this huge configuration management issue when they're built or if you have controls on them. Industrial controllers can have a variety of ports and protocols. Yes. They can be, it could just be like a shipbuilder just puts a cable in the wrong place. Yes. Um, and I'm wondering if you have any special considerations for configuration management of those clusters specific to, mm, specific, specific to those vessels? Yeah, two vessels. Uh, I mean, every single vertical, uh, I, I would, take retail out of that picture because retail is pretty mature, so they have some standards, but every single vertical has a very specific need for that. Uh, in terms of uh, what that hardware actually means, and they have a context, right? Like a, 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 an ethernet cable plugged into one in one place need not be the same thing in another place. And we have, again, that goes back to our policy and templating that we, we include as part of our product. And what, when I say like we manage edge uh, assets, I'm talking about managing your hardware, your uh, application stack, whether it is Kubernetes or Windows VMs, and also the policies and the security posture that you want to uh, actually have in that place. So these are all the things that we do. If you're interested, please uh, come and reach out to us. Like uh, we, we can uh, dig deeper into like what exactly you need uh, from those things. But yes, that's a very fair point, and we see that all the time. Any last question? OK, if there isn't any, thanks for your time. And hopefully, like, uh, you learned something. OK? Thanks, everyone.